Welcome to the Metal Voice. First time guest on the show, Andy Scott, the classic, I would say close to the original member of uh, the band suite that we all know and have loved for just so many, so many decades. How are you doing, Andy? Uh, yeah, I'm good. Uh, I'm probably the only guitar player and original member that anybody would remember, even though when the when the band was in their seminal um, finding their feet, there were two other guitar players that went and came and went rather quickly. So um, th this is the only lineup myself, Brian, Steve, and Mick were the only members that anybody would know of the of the band suite. It's like uh, I, I I still keep getting this, and it's like somebody saying, "Well, Dave Gilmore wasn't an original member of Pink yeah, Floyd, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know yeah. yet." You know, uh, and, and they're right, but um, it, it was like having two bands, and it's it's almost like saying, you know, Stevie Nicks and um, uh, Lindsey Buckingham, you know, but yet they 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 kickstarted, you know, uh, Fleetwood Mac again. You know, it it happens. Yet I go all the way back to 1970, and the band had had no success at that point, and here we are uh, in 2024. I'm the only one left standing. And I enjoy what I do, and I'm not going to stop if I can help it, you know? Well, you are, for me, the original member. I just I don't want to insult any of those other rock journalists who might say otherwise, right? But for me, you're, you know, yeah. Andy Scott is the guitarist of Sweet. And you, yeah. I mean, once I, you came into the band, it was just game over. Like, right? I mean, it was well, just... Well, I have to say that um, um, within the band, there was no um, uh, Bob Dylan or a certain type of songwriter so they needed some help with that, and uh, luckily, I, I can, I can put a tune together. You know. Yes, you can. Good, great news. You could put more than one tune together. Sweet Full Circle will be released on September the twentieth on Metalville, and this is. I'm not sure how many albums they, the band has had. It's it's difficult to say because there's a lot of repackaging over the years. But we'll say it's great to see that there's some music with Sweet with the original guitarist, Andy Scott. Um, <laughs> yeah. What is the musical direction? I've heard it, but others haven't. What is the musical direction of this album compared to the sweet classic albums that everybody knows? I guess if you spoke to a sweet audience, you might get, I don't know, a handful of ideas as to where they think that, that the sweet should go. Yeah. We've had many people, you know, come to me and say, oh, just write another Fox on the Run. Yeah. You do, you do realize that was 50 years ago. And, That's crazy. And the thing is, we've learned so much and l lost so much. And um, you don't go back and rewrite. Well, I suppose in, in the time scale, uh, we tried to rewrite another um, Fox on the Run with um, Lies in Your Eyes. You know, the, the, there were ideas to, to try and recreate some stuff. You keep moving forward, you learn stuff. You can't unlearn. It's, it's like once the egg's in the pan, you can't unfry it, you know, and, and you, your brain's a bit like that. You, you move on, you, you learn new things. There are things that I played on Sweet Fanny Adams and Desolation Boulevard, for example, that I would never play anymore because collectively in my head, those chords and those notes don't quite go together. Um, and, and you can't stop that now. Um, I can't just say, oh, sing that. It's, it sounds fine. In my head, it's slightly jarring. Um, and and in, in the song Action, there, there's some backwards uh, things that we sing. And the way we sing it, it crosses over uh, part of the, uh, of the descending guitar chord. And there are notes that, I mean, a classical composer would have no problem with it because that's what they do. They, they mix and match. And if somebody's singing a, an A up here, but the bass notes are B flat, they don't care because it's so far, so far apart. And, and there is something to be said for that. And, you know, as, as I say, uh, my songwriting is, has become far less prolific because I'm editing too much all the time. Um, I worry how, um, you know, um, I've met met a few guys who, who've written books and and things like this, and I, how yeah, how the hell do you churn them out? Because once you've had a few ideas, it must be difficult finding more and more. You know, 
So yeah. Oh, yeah. that's my excuse. Okay? <laughs> well, I mean, you brought so much to the table and, and, and what you brought to the table has resonated, you know, for 50 years, right? I mean, that from yeah. the from the loud guitars or the power chords or to the interesting compositions to the four part harmonies. And you get a lot of these four part harmonies on this album. How hard is it to pull off four heart part harmonies today on stage? Um, well, we're lucky. Um, I've, I've always had a, a brief in my head. Whoever is coming in to replace somebody, one thing they have to be able to do is sing something at some yeah. point, yeah. you know, uh, we've got four across the front now. We've got um, uh, Paul Manzi as lead vocalist. We've got Lee Small on bass, who's got a fantastic voice. And our second guitar player and keyboard player, uh, Tom, Tom Corey, he was in a band that I produced. And he was like, well, he was their own sort of, pro he was me in the, in that band. He was like a, a, the, the producer, the, um, the guy who's, um, uh, who, who's controlling things. So to have him in the band has, has been a godsend. You know, it's um, it, it's fantastic. And um, uh, so there's never any problem, you know, kind of recreating the um, the four part harmonies in in certain songs. What there is is in certain songs where we've done crossovers, where there's a three part harmony doing that, and then a, a gang voice doing that, and then a two part coming in to add a few things. That's where it gets a little difficult because you have people almost finishing the chorus and then adding the little two parts at the end, you know. So it, it, it's not impossible, although, um, you know, if if we had been, if, if we had written Bohemian Rhapsody, I don't think we would have been able to reproduce it no, live no, either. No, 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 you know? no, no. And it's understood, too, when it gets way over anybody's, you know, way too complicated on stage. You know, a couple of backing tracks is not the end of the world, but still, the you, you see less of the four-part harmonies on record today. You know, a less bands yeah. doing that today. Um, well, I'm not. I'm, I, I think it's um, um, your um, American bands that have started the. Well, let's just put a couple of things on track. You know, I, I do festivals with with a lot of mixed bands, and. I think you have to look to bands like um, us and Uriah Heep uh, and Deep Purple. Um, there's very little going on other than what you're hearing played live. Wow. I've been on the side of the stage and only heard uh, drums because all the guitars are plugged into the the system. At, you know, with with these you know Kempers and whatever, uh, and um, there's no monitoring hardly hardly on stage and. Yeah, out front, it's blaring. It's 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 like almost like the record, and that's what gets you to thinking: Is it the record? <laughs> is that what we're listening to? Is, are we listening to so much, you know, integrated into the performance? And do the audience really care? Because they seem to be having a good time. Then they're, they're not like a musician going, "Oh, well, he's not playing that," you know, who's being not critical, but just just understanding what's going on. I think that um, uh, this is why I'm not good at gigs anymore. There's too many people, and I I start talking to my wife, saying, "What do you think of this?" Then you know, and and all she wants to do is enjoy herself, and she tells me to shut up. So, and I you, think she's she's probably right. Before all these, uh, you know, tracks and computers and laptops, back in the olden days, how did you guys pull off the four? Part harmonies live is just basically practicing right well it is uh we come from an era where we didn't have monitors on stage in the late 60s early 70s um and pa systems were of a uh, very limited idea i mean one of the first bands that i uh, um, saw and played with and supported was a band called yes who had a real pa system they had a real PA system back in the uh, like 67, 68, 69 period. And every time we saw them, they redesigned it slightly. You know, they'd worked out that you needed like big 15, 18 inch speakers on the bottom. You needed something like 12s and 10s in the middle. And you needed some kind of horn system to get the highs there. And somehow, and, and, and they had different amps like 
WEM amps to, to power the WEM 18s at the bottom and d d different, you know, it, and it was integrated and it sounded really, really good because most bands that you saw had two or four, you know, columns either side of the stage, no monitors. And you just um, had to get on with it and you learn how to sing in tune because you can't really hear much else because it, it's, it's all happening. You know, yeah, that's a good um, analogy. Yes, yes. You know, everyone could sing in the band, or at least almost yeah. everyone could sing. Yeah, well, e e everybody in Sweet could, and um, we also realized that certain microphones don't, you know, spill all of the um, all of the stuff that, that's coming off the stage. Which is why, um, for example, our drummer used to use the ones that had like a more of a capsule rather than the big round head. Mm -hmm. so that he could get his mouth fairly close to it and you wouldn't hear the drums coming through it. Um, and um, the, the kind of power that we had was something like two or 400 watts of Marshall with four columns, and that was only used for voices. Hence, the amps were turned up and the drums. The drum kit starts the, um, the volume, Yeah, you know? Mm -hmm. And that's you then work to that. If you can't hear the drums, you're too loud. So you turn your amp down slightly. But uh, once we get into uh, the um, uh, where everything is now mic'd up and, you know, amps need to be a little bit smaller, yet you still want it to look right. The majority of bands had this uh, amps around the back that they were miking up. And you looked at the or one of the speakers out of the eight was was used you know it's uh and and of course with side fills and monitors uh, as time went on uh you were able to hear what you were doing all over the stage and um you know that's really what we what we kind of go for you know how many uh, artists over the years or what artists surprised you that has come up to you or sent you an email or called you saying you know what i was influenced by sweet i know axel rose was a, a fan of sweet but have you ever talked to Axel or has any sent you a message or anyone else for that matter? Uh, no, I would appreciate a few messages. Um, <laughs> back in the early 80s, I think it was, we, um, I used to get a phone call in the middle of the night once in a while and some guy was saying that his name was Nicky Six. <laughs> now, whether, whether this was true or not, I don't know. But he, he was telling me how, um, and I said, I know for you, I said, it's, you've been out and had a beer uh, and you want to call me at four in the morning and it's something like uh, eight o'clock at night for you. I said, why don't you ring me? But the, then I said, you probably won't be compassmentous if you ring me at midnight and it's eight o'clock in the morning for me, which would be much more sensible. Um, and he was just saying, look, you produce great records. Why don't you come and produce us? And I said, send me an airfare and I'll be over. Because at that point in my life, that's what I was trying to do. I was I was being a producer. I was um, songwriting, and um, you know because the band hadn't folded. It, it had just come into some kind of weird hiatus, and um, and that didn't happen. Uh, and then I heard uh, a few months later that um, uh, somebody had picked up their demos, tarted them up, and they'd released that as their first album. Well, when he sent me the demos on a on a cassette, I thought. Well, first of all, we've got to get a drummer and a bass player who can play in time with each other, you know, because th th that was the main thing back then. We're talking, you know, come on, you know, it, 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 we've had punk, but, but you know, you don't need to be like this. It can be organized. It can be, it can be tight. It can be punchy, you know. So um, it, it was him. It was Nicky Six, right? Well, I, th it was. I think it probably was, yeah. Uh, and, and the other thing, the, the other thing was... Um, uh, I, I had a message not that long ago. Um, somebody reminded um, uh, Gene Simmons that it was the 50th anniversary of Ballroom Blitz uh, back end of last year. And they were out in South America somewhere and he's in full makeup and he's about to go on stage. And some guy said, do that message for Andy. So he goes, hey, Andy. He said, just realize 50 years of, um, of uh, Ballroom Blitz. He said, Marvelous. He said, we still play it all the time. And the song ACDC. He said, I don't mean the band. I mean the song. And he said, and then he looks at the guy, he says, where are we? And the guy says, Santiago. He said, yeah, we're in Santiago, Chile. I'm about to go on stage. He said, just keep rocking. And, and I thought that, that, that was really, really nice. You know, 
Uh, plus, I'm in touch with people like um, Joe Elliott from Def Leppard because we're both football fanatics and uh, he supports uh, Sheffield United and I support Wrexham, uh, the ones who have been taken over by Ryan Reynolds and Rob McKelleny. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's, uh, it, well, it's, it's a big improvement what they're doing. Uh, to to what's been going on for the past twenty years, you know, it's um, it looks like we're finally going to get somewhere. <laughs> well, well, Joe Elliott. I mean, it's it's pretty obvious in the Def Leppard music, the part, you know, the four part harmonies that they do, right? I, I'm sure that mm. played a huge role in, or you know, you guys played yeah. a huge role in their life. I mean, I did say to him because I realized that it's not always the band doing all the backing vocals, especially when Matt Langer was with them. I said you should have given me a call. I'd have come and done the backing vocals for you. <laughs> that's good uh, well, I remember in the 80s Paul Mario Day who had a great voice he was the original oh. original singer of Iron Maiden yeah and actually that performance live at in London oh at yeah the Marquee Club I think it was the Marquee Club yeah why didn't you ever continue with Paul because he was fantastic well we would have um, it's just that in Australia on our second tour he met a lady and when we were in downtime, he kept going back to Australia. And um, then there was one, a, a series of dates towards the end of the 80s where he said, is there any way we could do this without me? And we had another singer in the band who was a lead singer mm-hmm. who played, played bass, a guy called Mal McNulty. And he took over and we got another guy in to play the bass on this. We had a TV show and a gig in Holland. Uh, and we still had the keyboard player, uh, Phil Lanson, who's now with Uriah Heep. We had him in the band. So I thought, well, we got to give it a go. And um, it went really well. And then I, I said to Paul, um, well, we have some other stuff coming up. And it was at this point where he said, Andy, I would like to stay in Australia. And I said, well, good luck, Mick. Good luck. I, I take my hat off to you. And, uh, you know, true love, you know, never runs smoothly, I said. But, you know, you, you, you get on with it. And he was living near Bondi, Bondi Beach. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then I, I heard a few years later that he would had a split and he'd moved to Newcastle, which is just north of Sydney. But we've kept in touch all this time. And every time we go back to Australia, he comes to one of the gigs and gets up and sings maybe set me free, you know, one of the oh, yeah. one of the hard rock songs, you know? So, um, yes, I agree with you. Uh, he, he was a good, very good choice at the time. And, um, but see lead singers, they like drummers. They are a breed. They are not, they're not, they're not like me and you, they, you know, <laughs> they are different, you know, there's, there's, there's no doubt about it. <laughs> Ballroom Blitz. We'll go back and forth from the new album and, and the legacy of the band because I'm a huge fan for many, many years. Uh, decades, we'll say. A Ballroom Blitz. The legacy of Bla- Ballroom Blitz. You see it on Wayne's World. You see Crocus. You just so, see so many bands. When I used to go to, a, when I was a young teenager, I used to go to clubs forcefully, but at the end of the night, they play Ballroom Blitz in Canada. So, I mean, there's this massive legacy. Tell me about the legacy of the song. And I know it was written by Mike Chapman and Nikki Chen, right? But what is the legacy to you of Ballroom Blitz? Um, I mean, the band had a lot of input in that recording. Um, it wasn't the way that we saw it in the beginning because we were really um, feeling our uh, Deep Purple Led Zeppelin clone. So we didn't think that that, open-handed shuffle was what we would have done with it when we started to re- rehearse it. But our producer, Phil Wainman, is an ex-drummer. And when he walked in the room and he heard us, he went, well, pretty good. He said, but I've had this brilliant idea. And he went over to Mick and he said the words, Gene Krupa, Sandy Nelson. And him and Mick then, we were told, the rest of the band, go away for an hour, go and have a cup of tea at a sandwich somewhere and come back. And when we came back, there was this killer of a drum track, you know, with the open handed and then the, yeah. the drum, you know, and, and it's like, well, now we've got to fit around that. And, um, 
uh, of course, I was uh, at that point in my full Richie Blackmore, Jeff Beck mode, it, you know, for, for want of anything better. So I had to go backwards in my thought patterning and clean the guitar sound up a little bit and just make it, make it, make it work for what it was because recording um, is, is about making what you're doing the best, not this is the way I want to play it and I'm go then I'm going home because that will get you nowhere. And um, uh, I think that what that song has done for us, it's if you, if you weren't really a sweet fan and you heard Boring Blitz, I think you were after, after hearing it. It's that kind of a song. And it's the same with if you were a prog rock fan. This, I, I found this out, who weren't that aware, aware of sweet. You know, oh, the sweet, yeah. They hear love is like oxygen. And now they're coming to the gigs going, God, what have I been missing all, all this time, you know? And it's, um, it's, it, there's something for everyone in, in the suite. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I would I, say I, that. I, 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 think, I think you nailed it. I mean, the, the power of the guitar it, it appeals to the hard rock metal fans and the vocals appear to the prog fans, the arrangements to the prog fans, and also to the ladies, right? Who like more melody in their music, right? And yeah, uh, yeah it's got something for everyone. The 16s. Uh, the six, the sixteens. I mean, is it supposed to be sixteen or their sixteens? I've never six understood that. Teens. Six teens. So six teens, like six and, and, and teenagers. Yeah. Is that supposed Bro, to be like up. a play on words? Is that it? Yeah, that 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 was Mike Chapman. He um he came back from America um, with lots of ideas and. He missed out on being involved with the Sweet Fanny Adams album because him and Nicky were living in California. Mm -hmm. And when they came back, uh, we hadn't had a single off the um, Sweet Fanny Adams album. It was just an album. And I think in some ways, that's why it sold so well and went up the charts. Um, also, uh, Mike came back with this buzzing California idea. Now, he knew we were never going to be the Eagles, Mm -hmm. But he thought, I'm going to be able to do something about that sort of California uh, psychedelia and mix it in with, with what the suite can do brilliantly. And uh, when, when he played the 16s to me, I was thinking about that band Love. Um, there, there was, um, oh, God, it, it was, I'm trying to think of the name of the song. I think it was called Alone Again okay. um, but by the band Love. And, and I just said to him, God, that takes me right back to that hippie time in the mid '60s, when I was just picking things up and you know getting to grips with things like bands like um, Spirit, mm -hmm. you know, and, um, um, and and it was just uh, amazing. I was in as, as soon as he played me that on the acoustic guitar. I went right. I'm in. Let let's see what we can do with this. And Mick with his drum patterns and not just waiting to come in and go. Bratbum, you know, playing that brat da da, ba, ba da da da. It was just one of those moments, and um, you know, I'm um, I still think that probably is the best thing that he ever wrote for us, you know, yeah. as, as a song, you know. Yeah. Let me ask you this: so now they have there was like there was a lot of fractions of over the years of different sweets, and I got an email the other day saying Sweet just came out with a new song, and I was going, what? It wasn't yeah. you. It was Steve's Priest's former band. Back in, I mean, back how, did in they, bands, how did yeah. they even how did they even get away with something like that? Like I don't know. It was kind of right. Kind of shocking. It, it's complicated. Um, I, when we came back on the road, Mick Tucker and I, in the early to mid eighties, uh, we asked Steve, and I thought Steve was going to come back and do some touring with us, mm -hmm. and then he didn't, and then he came to stay with me. And while we were talking, uh, there was a video about to be released of our greatest hits, and we were all going to go mm -hmm. and uh, make an appearance at a at a big store in the centre of London. And we were out one night, you know, having a bite to eat and drinking. And and I said, why didn't you come back? He said, Andy, I hated touring. And he said, I found myself in the situation of just wanting to get away from England because of his, I think his uh, first marriage was not, or all, all it was cracked up to be, but that's that's still, you know, you sort that out, you know, you don't just run away kind of thing. 
but he'd found um, uh, a lady in America and he, he moved in, into New York. Um, so I, I said to him, if this really takes off again, would you be back as, as the bass player? And he went, no. I said, not even for a million quid. And he went, well, maybe. And I think that's where the motivation with Steve was. Uh, plus also, we've got to a point now in the 2000s, 2010, and we hadn't been that active. I just um, contracted pro prostate cancer. Oh. And uh, I'm now 15 years with it, you know, but, wow. but still, still okay, still doing okay. And um, then I heard... Uh, we weren't gigging as such because I was having treatment. And my agent got a, a thing through the post, based, uh, through the email, saying um, there's, um, uh, there's a bit of the contract that, 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 that we need to kind of um, uh, discuss. And it was a band called The Suite doing some country fair in the Midwest, in, London, in, in America. So he's, he ran me up. He said, I know, I know you're not feeling all that good, but he said, I think uh, Steve's formed, formed a band in America. When we looked at the contract, he hadn't signed it. It was one of the other guys, uh, mm -hmm. the, the guitar player he had first off, who's no longer there. And um, so I, I eventually called him and said, um, uh, so wouldn't you, wouldn't you have thought to have called me and have the real thing going on? W would have been a bit better. And, and he just kind of was bit withdrawn and just basically said look i just wanted to do some gigs and i said fine you know i took him at face value but you see what happens is you get guys who are this is the best thing that's ever happened to them and they get a little bit um looking ahead wow. of themselves and you get dragged into this situation whereby not just doing a few gigs anymore but trying to be the sweet you know and I think it's, it, it becomes contagious. And when he died in 2020, I thought to myself, well, you know, that's really sad. Um, but, but now, at least, we might be able to come back into America. And, of course, the, the worst thing that happened was, I don't know what, what happened to Steve and money and all that stuff, but I had this message from Maureen, his wife, saying, uh, well, I, I'm going to need to carry on working and we'll probably keep the band together. And I, I'm thinking, no, wh wh why would you do that? And, and I think they're talking about the fact that they need to live kind of thing, that, that they, they need a, a, a need business, help. if you like. Yeah. And I'm thinking, well, look, I don't know how to say this. And, and uh, from then onwards, it's been at arm's length, you know, when she, when she emails me and things like that. But she's the, uh, I think, think there's a guy in the band who's the driving force. And I think she is as well because her name is at the at the top of like Steve had a trademark in America. Um, it's the one place I didn't, yeah. and and that's that's why we're in this situation. I mean, the rest of the world, you know, we travel all the time. We even played in Canada not that long ago. And the the thing is, if we went to America, if somebody did did pick pick up the baton and went, yeah, I want your band to come and play in America. There are ways around it. We would call ourselves UK Sweet or something, <laughs> That's right. you know, That's UK right. Sweet, and in brackets, the originals, yeah, you know. Yeah, you, yeah. It, there are ways around this. You don't just have to, you know, um, bicker ab ab about the name. But I actually think they would have done better to have chosen a name that relates to the Sweet and be the probably one of the best tribute bands that they could be. That's right. Because they would get, first of all, they would get more work and people would know what they were. But yeah. I'm, not in, I'm not in control of it. So, yeah. so, so it is a trademark territory. That's what it's coming down to. Well, and, and you and I know, once you start battling over not very much, remember, right. because we're not talking about, it's not interfering with me. You know, it's not something um, that, that, that is like making me go, you know, the, 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 it's it's just um, it's not even annoying. It's just a little a little thing that that, that crops up once in a while, and um, I enjoy where I live. You know, um, I don't want to start putting the rest of my life on 
on hold or, or on the line because somebody is trading, you know, on, on a name that, that, that ethically they shouldn't be, you know? I think the word is ethical, even though they can yeah. do it and they want to do it and they want to make an name. I think ethically they should just be upfront with the clients, which are the fans. And it's okay yeah. to be a tribute band. There's tribute bands everywhere and it keeps the music alive. There's nothing mm. wrong with that. Well, the the other thing is, I th I think that that the way that uh, one of the guys in the band sees it, he he doesn't see that that we have been on the road uh, with a short hiatus in the early eighties, ever since nineteen seventy. He sees it as the sweep making a comeback in two thousand and ten when Steve formed this band. And what can I say? You know that it is that what is, it is. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Let's, let's talk about this new album, Rising Up. When I, you know, the album is pretty good. It's just like you said. It's got little moments of everything throughout the history yeah. as well as and beyond, right? Yeah. To me, it sounds like, you know, like a superhero soundtrack in a way, right? Yeah. <laughs> it, it's, it's, is that, you, there's a lot of that. Yeah. Well, you mentioned Rising Up. That's one of the songs. Do you like that song in particular? I, 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 that's why I mentioned it because it reminds yeah. me if I was watching a superhero movie, I could just picture that song right there, mm -hmm. you know, uh, in that as a soundtrack. Yeah, that was written by Paul and Lee, the bass player, uh, Paul, the lead vocalist. Um, I'm not the only one who writes anymore, which, which is really good. Um, Lee has a track record of um, coming up with some stuff. Uh, he was the singer um, on lots of recordings with uh, Magnum for a while. Yeah. And um, I, um, I'm, I'm appreciative of uh, of all the work that everybody's putting in. I mean, the, the guy who co-produced it with me is Tom, mm -hmm. the, the guy who, as I say, came from another band that I was producing. And I'm, um, I'm very aware of their talents. You know, I, I don't want to be stifling. I don't, I don't want this moment of, well, you can't write, I'm writing everything. Because if they come up with the goods, that's what we need, you know. Exactly. Any one of, of these tracks on there, I think... There's no fillers. I think that any one of these tracks would be happily played on radio in most parts of the okay. world. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Changes. You got a little keyboard throwback from the 70s or the late 70s. I'm sure you did that on purpose, right? To just remember what yeah. it's like to have a little keyboard riff in there, a little sweet yeah. keyboard riff. Yeah. It's um, um, the, uh, the song. Uh, I had that. Um, way back, um, we're talking more than 50 years ago, my original idea for the song. And it was um, like some kind of, I hate to say Mark Boland, but it's like when Mark Boland used to play the acoustic guitar and he just would just chunk it, not play the big chords. And, and, and I'd written this song that was, um, um, you know, I'm going through changes, you know, because right at that time, uh, we just started to have success and the changes that were happening were happening really quickly. All of a sudden, uh, we had cars that didn't break down. We were living in houses that, that, that were actually very nice. You know, this wasn't the squat in London that virtually that I was living in when I first moved to London. And it, it's that kind of thing that that you. But I never I never really finished the song. Uh, Bowie had a song called Changes at the same sort of time, and and I, and that that made me bulk a little bit, you know, because uh, that was one of my favorite albums, Hunky Dory. And um, there's a friend of mine who works with me who has resurrected changes twice before. And I've said, won't work on this album, won't work. And this particular time when he resurrected it, I gave it uh, my original demo. I gave it to Tom and he came back with the slightly rearranged uh, sound. And I went, that's great. Now we can do it, you know. And yeah. and and there we are. Another great song is "Defender," another superhero inspirational song. I, I don't know why I keep I keep going there, but I do. Yeah. And that's a good thing. It's a good thing. Yeah. Well, we had "Defender" out um, just before the pandemic. Uh, it was it was released, um, and um, it, it was with another singer about six years ago. And I thought that's too. Uh, and then all of a sudden, we we, we were coming up. Um, towards the, the pandemic, it didn't do anything, Defender, and I kept it in mind. And I thought um, the same way as um, everything. The song "Everything" was on an album twenty years ago, uh, twenty-five years ago, and I was thinking, I was thinking these songs 
cannot be forgotten. So we just redid them with this band. And all of a sudden, we find ourselves with a, uh, as what, as what, uh, my um, management in, in Germany, the, the digital management company, the guy turned around to me and he said, all killers, no fillers. <laughs> that's and, right. and I went, well, that's really nice to hear that is, you know. <laughs> full circle. I guess you yeah. guys have gone full circle. I guess that's what that song's about. Another good song. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, I had the idea uh, for the for the full circle, but I didn't have any riff. And Tom had put this riff together, that, that sort of slightly discordant um, guitar riff, which reminds me of, you know, bands like Yes. And um, as we talked about earlier, you mm -hmm. know, it just had something that was, um, pleasant but jarring. You know, it made you immediately go, "Wow!" And and we wanted it to be fairly military because the whole idea of full circle is we never learn. We start off in peace. We have to go through all these wars to find peace again. You know that that was the concept. And um, you know, you you find beautiful moments, and then you find this um, uh, moment where you know you. you Full circle, full circle. You know, it's it's a, uh, um, it's it's quite poetic, I guess, in the in the long run. Yeah, go back, going back in time, Nikki, uh, Mike Chapman, and Nikki Chen, breaking off from them. I guess they 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 came to you guys with so many great ideas, and you guys really worked on some amazing songs. But slowly breaking off from them was it difficult? Was it difficult to cut the cord? Well. I'm finding out things after the fact um, that by that time in 75, Mike had had enough of Nicky and wanted to break that bond. Okay. But he was finding it difficult. Um, I remember Mike saying to me once, he said, I moved to California thinking, I said, oh, I thought you moved together. And he went, no, no, I moved to California because I wanted to get some of that vibe. And, and he said, I find out a few months later, you know, a couple of months later, that he's living down the road from me. And he knocked on my door. And I'm thinking, what do I have to do? So his next move was to Connecticut. And apparently Nicky moved to New York. You know, it's it's one you, you know, to, to try and keep the uh the the thing going. But he said by that time, he said, you know, I was producing, you know, Blondie and and thing think things like that. And I actually went with Mike um, to um, Santa Monica on the on the boardwalk there. There was a big club. And he said, I'm going to take you to see a band that they've asked me to produce. I'm, you're going to see something. And I thought, right, okay. So we stayed. And the final song they played was uh, My Sharona. Oh. And I went, I now see why you want to produce this band i said you could record that now with one mic in front of them and it would be that good and he said that's the intention he said it's got to sound like they do in this venue it's got to sound like that because i said it and the arrangement was perfect and yeah. i think i remember him telling me uh, he said um it didn't take long to record you know the band was so well rehearsed they went in the studio and you know probably had it nailed like like um like sweet records back in the seventies, you know, we used to be quick at yeah. nailing stuff. Um, but um, but but you see, it wasn't that difficult to move away from Nicky and Mike at that point, especially when we'd redone Fox on the Run and it had become the biggest hit we'd had. It was the biggest hit all around the world. So was Brian Connolly getting kicked? I guess in the throat was that sort of the the point where where you had success it could have been massive success that there's prevented. one thing one thing that keeps cropping up about that I wonder why Brian was out on his own not too far from where he lived driving his Mercedes when he probably had a drink and finding a couple of guys not trashing but jumping on his Mercedes to, so that the you know the the, the horns were going and when he came out of the club, he says, and I have to believe him, somebody hit him from behind and the other two guys kicked him. And then, then they ran off. Now, whether he'd pissed somebody off, maybe he'd um, 
uh, tried to pick up a girl. Who knows? He doesn't even remember much because they kicked him in the head, I think, and he was in hospital for a little while. We had a gig coming up in about a month's time after that uh, with The Who at yeah. Charlton Athletic Football Ground in London. We'd been asked uh, um, by Pete Townsend. He called us in the studio and I spoke to him. And I said, um, this is really good of you. you know, and he, went, he said, well, I came to a gig. You didn't know I was there. So he obviously came to the Rainbow gig mm -hmm. in London, um, the Christmas gig, and he obviously enjoyed what he saw. And he, um, and he wanted us to do the um, – and he put us on later in the bill. Um, other people like Joe Walsh and uh, Little Feet and other bands like that were before us. Um, and when we said, I'm sorry, but Brian's been injured, we can't do this, uh, Lou Reed took our place on that wow. bill and it, it kind of that might have changed a lot being able to play that gig but it didn't happen uh and it took brian quite a few months to to, to get over this and um uh, we didn't go back into the studio um until oh was that 77 when was that no it was 70 it, it was i think it, it was after fox on the run you know uh, and I don't think we went into the studio until towards the end of the year or the late summer. And we started to do backing tracks for the, the Give Us a Wink album. Okay. All you know, right. something like that. Yeah. All right. Uh, in the last few minutes, I'm just going to name you a few songs. Just give me a quick little, what do you think about it? Uh, okay. Sweet F.A. The legacy of Sweet F.A. Well, Sweet F.A. Um, was always in our minds um the you know that you know that what sweet fa stands for well i'm assuming it's the the cursing of a sweet fuck all yeah. but yeah okay yeah, exactly yeah and we wanted to call the, the 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 album that and of course the the record company aren't going for that so and we also wanted to call it sweet fa and they said no you're still a bit too close for all of that so we then called the album sweet fanny adams but yes. we got away with calling the song sweet fa because Sweet Penny Adams is uh, like London slang for sweet fuck all. So, yes, yes, you know? yes. No, and, you um, don't. No, you don't. Yeah. That was a that Chapman was a, one, right? Yeah, that was a great track. Um, he wasn't impressed with the way that we'd arranged it, though. Um, I think he, he liked um, what, what we'd done, you know, with Steve singing uh, and, and the, the way that Phil Main, Wayman has produced it. But my inner Pete Townsend came out in the middle section with the acoustic guitars and the synthesizers yeah. and everything. I don't think he saw it as that kind of a, you know, um, arrangement and pompous, you know, thing. But um, um, yeah, it did it did well, and it was a, a a big hit for Pat Benatar. Set me free, one of your arrangements. Yeah, well, it um, set me free was on my. Uh, garage tapes, as I called them. Uh, when I moved out of London, I lived in a, a th uh, like a small cottage um, mm -hmm. near Heathrow Airport, and it had a garage, um, which for me that was that became a workshop. So I, I hung carpets on the wall. I had nothing else that I could do. Um, set up my studio in there, and I was in there most days, you know, recording stuff. And I pulled out just before Sweet Fanny Adams eight songs, of which three were recorded for Sweet Fanny Adams. Yeah. All right. On that note, uh, is if there's anything else you want to promote, just go right ahead. If you want something to plug, other than your new album. Um, well, the new album, Full Circle. You know, that that's pretty good. Uh, we're we're on tour um, from the end of September all the way through to the end of the year. When I say on tour, I mean nipping out to Germany for three or four gigs, coming home, nipping out to Germany for three or four gigs, coming home and the same. And then when we hit November, we're doing a cruise out of Sydney mm -hmm. in Australia. And straight on the back of that, we have something like uh, 12 dates over a three week period in Australia. Okay. Uh, I'm kind of looking forward to that, but on the other hand, I'm not kind of looking forward to it because of my um, health situation and the fact that they're going to start, that's when it's going to start ramping up the 30 degrees, you know, in certain places. So uh, as long as they've got air conditioning in all the hotels, I'm going to be all right. 
Um, and then we come home um, at the end of November and we have um, a short tour of the UK where we're going to be doing some of the um, uh, some of the decent venues, uh, not the not not the big theatres or arenas, but these places called academies. Uh, and there's a lovely place uh, run by KK from um, Judas KK's, Priest. Yes, Steel Mill. Steel, Steel Mill. Yeah, we, we're we're playing that. The last time we played there, it was a blast. So, um, and we we bumped into KK at Wacken this year mm. when we played the festival there. And um, he's a lovely guy. So, yes, you know, yes. and, and he said he would come down. And I said, well, you better bring one of your uh, flying V's because you're going to be, if you come and see us, you're going to be getting on stage, mate. <laughs> um, is your prostate cancer stabilized? It's, 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 it's... Um, yeah, I, uh, there are normal stages for me. I'm, I'm where it's at. And um, I've not had chemotherapy, mm -hmm. but I'm, very aware uh, of the stuff that I'm taking. It sometimes agrees, sometimes not so much. Um, but I'm learning to, you know, li live with that. I don't have any stress in my life whatsoever. Um, I have people like my son is brilliant. He He's our sound engineer, but he's more like a tour manager. And I've, the guys in the band are just so brilliant. They're all now... Uh, when we get to a very big airport, if there's no buggy that will take me from the lounge to the to the gate, because sometimes mm -hmm. we're talking a kilometre here. Yes. Um, the other guys go rushing out and grab a wheelchair, and then they start racing me like some Formula One, you know, <laughs> <laughs> to, to the gate. So um, it's a bit hair raising, but you know, it, it it's um, it's working rather well. You know, my cousin's got the stage four prostate cancer, but he's, oh, on, right. some, he's on some medication that's, he, he seems fine. He just, it just yeah. stabilizes him. And, and I guess that's the good news, if there's any good news of yeah. uh, prostate. So um, hopefully everything will well, be Well, mine, mine is a, a form of hormone um, yeah. where they've channeled it so that it attacks or neutralizes the things that, that are going to be uh, naughty. Um, yeah, yeah. And as, as I said, it's a, it's a bastard of a disease. Yeah. And the sooner we try and eradicate it, but I think with what we're doing in the world, we'll never probably eradicate it. The best we're going to get is to kind of stop the cells from turning against the cells in, you know, each cell. Uh, you stick with the host. You don't go rogue. You don't start becoming a different kind of cell to attack the host, you know, and that, that's, that's what it's all about. Well, there's no money in curing diseases. All the money is in maintaining your health. <laughs> you just keep yes. taking the same drug forever. There's more money in that, yeah. right? It's like toner yeah. cartridge for printers. Yeah. Right? I, I right. suppose uh, we, I suppose we all thought of, thought of it differently in the 70s and 80s when uh, there was a different kind of drug going around. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> all right, sweet. Full circle on Metalville uh, coming out September 20th. Go pick it up. Andy, thank you so much for your time. Have yourself a wonderful yeah. day. It's been fabulous. Thank you, Mick.